namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa buddhang dhammang sanghang namasami Today is uh, Sunday, April the 12th, and uh, welcome to another of these uh, Sunday afternoon uh, webcasts. Uh, I'd like to begin uh, today by recognizing the fact that uh, this is the time of Songkran, which uh, in Thailand and uh, Cambodia, Laos, uh, Burma, uh, India, Sri Lanka, or through South a Asia, this is a New Year festival time, and it's the one festival in the Buddhist year at least that is uh, marked by the position of the sun rather than by what the moon is doing uh, and so this is a, a water festival uh, in Thailand uh, usually it occurs uh, in the middle of the hot season uh, and uh, so it's a, a water festival and it's a, a way of uh, sprinkling water pouring water uh, to uh, say invite auspicious influences to um, Bring the monsoon uh, in, uh, in in according in accordance with customs and uh, understanding traditions. It's also a time in the calendar where the lay people come to the monastery and uh, 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 ritually wash their hands or wash the whole the, the whole body of the uh, sangha. And um, it's a time for asking for forgiveness, for the expression of faith and uh, gratitude. And uh, so I'm very very aware that uh, every year we have this uh, gathering. Here in Amravati on, on this uh, this time of the year, uh, this uh, middle of, of April like this, uh, and this year we can't do that. The social distancing protocols require that we can't draw close. Uh, the gates are closed to visitors, so um, uh, we have to consider this a sort of disembodied or um, arupa version of the Songkran festival, a uh, formless version. But it's a good opportunity both to um, they express our, our feelings of gratitude and appreciation and asking for forgiveness from each other and to, to bring to mind those who've been particularly beneficial and helpful in, in our lives and to um, share the blessings of, of our life with uh, those beings, our, our teachers, our parents uh, and uh, leaders in society. So I'd also like to uh, take this opportunity to uh, dedicate the Blessings of our practice, our lives, particularly for those who are in the front lines of caring for the the coronavirus, this COVID-19 infection all around the world, the nurses, doctors, uh, support workers, all of the hospital staff, and the ambulance drivers, and the carers who are literally putting their lives on the line. And many dozens have passed away, not just in, in this country, but all throughout the world, really uh, extraordinary generosity and kindness and selfishness, people literally giving their lives for the benefit of others. So, I'm sorry to and I really hope um, that uh, our, I would say, our commitment to uh, developing goodness, developing wisdom, and uh, the spiritual path is something that we consciously dedicate for all these beings. Also, within this country, uh, Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, has been very sick in hospital with the, the COVID-19 infection. And so this is a, a good time to put aside all kinds of partisan affiliations, um, whether you like the politics of the Conservative Party or you don't, or you like Boris Johnson or you don't as a person. That's something one can put aside uh, at a time like this, because uh, taking the responsibility of leadership, in a, uh, especially in a time of uh, deep uh, difficulty and crisis and challenge such as this is not a, an easy thing. So that um, being in a, uh, a small role of leadership just here in this monastery with 60 people um, uh, here, living here at Amravati at the moment, uh, uh, the UK has 60 million. So Boris Johnson's responsibilities are literally a million times bigger than mine. So I feel that uh, it's good also to share the blessings of our lives consciously with him to help him to recover from the sickness, particularly, immediately, but also to, to do the job he needs to do in the role of leadership and, and helping to guide things in a skillful way for, for the whole country. 
But also, along with being Songkran, today is Easter Sunday, so many auspicious uh, elements coming together at this time. Uh, so the, in the Christian world, at least the uh, uh, Western European um, dating for Easter, then this is Easter Sunday. And um, in the uh, Christian mythology, this is a time where Jesus has been crucified on, on Good Friday, and then there's the resurrection on the, the Sunday. And so this was uh, a day that's not doesn't have a particular presence in the Buddhist calendar, but uh, being here in the West, and also many of us coming from Christian backgrounds, I, I feel it's always good to reflect upon these uh, these uh, say themes that uh, occupy an important role in the, the Christian world, the, the countries where we we are living at this time. And uh, it's good to reflect: on what does Easter mean? That does the all of the symbolism around Easter, the very word Easter, East is where the sun rises. Um, the, the, uh, the, the name for, for Easter also comes like the, for the, uh, the hormone estrogen, um, the ancient uh, uh, Northumbrian goddess of the dawn, Istra. Uh, these are all related um, to each other in our, in our language. And it's about the, uh, the conquest of, of death. It's about the, uh, the coming back uh, of of the life principle, and also that symbol of, of Jesus being crucified on the cross and then uh, uh, coming back to life, being resurrected, coming out of, of the tomb, um, it's about the conquest of death. So in, in our Buddhist calendar, we have um, the festival of Visakha Puja, the full moon of May, where the, uh, the, um, the birth, the enlightenment, and the final passing away of the Buddha are celebrated. And I often like to reflect that really the uh, the Buddha's enlightenment, uh, that's it, within, our, within our Buddhist mythology, that's the, the symbol, the embodiment of the Buddha's conquest of death. It's like literally Mara, uh, the, uh, the um, entity whose, whose name means death. There's this uh, mythological the story of the Buddha's encounter with Mara as the Buddha sits down under the Bodhi tree and dedicates his heart to a, a awakening, and then Mara appears in various forms to try and dissuade or, or distract the uh, the newly the, the nearly awakened Buddha from the task of, of a full enlightenment, but uh, Mara does not succeed, and the, the full enlightenment, the Sama Sambodhi, uh, the full uh, enlightenment of the Buddha, then uh, occurs on that full moon day of May. So this is our way of speaking about that conquest of death, and in the Christian terms, even though I'm sure theologians and Buddhist philosophers might say it's not the same, it's not the same. I feel that. Uh, in the most broad human terms, uh, it's talking about how we conquer death um, and uh, with the, uh, the possibility of that, uh, particularly in this time of the, the coronavirus and this epidemic and the Dhamma reflection that the Lumpur Samedo shared with so many uh, people around the world during this last week. And also the name of this monastery, Amaravati, the, the deathless realm. Uh, these uh, these uh, dates in the calendar, these events, uh, these stories, these uh, say symbolize or remind us of the, the fact that the death can be transcended, that that uh, is not the, the whole of the story, and that there is a, a way that the heart can free itself from the confines of birth and death. It can realize that which is beyond time, that which is unborn, undying. That which is say unconditioned, that which is is timeless, which is intrinsically transcendent, free from the limitations of birth and death. So it's an encouraging time. And so this like the Songkran is the, the festival of um, the pouring of water, and then the the, the dry ground of, uh, of uh, the the middle of the hot season is sprinkled, and then new life uh, comes forth from the dry ground. So in a similar way, it's a, a recollection. These, these festivals, these, this time of the year, is a way of recollecting that potential, that possibility that the heart can free itself from that dryness, that aridity, that, that barren quality. I'm also reminded of uh, uh, T.S. Eliot's um, poem uh, that begins, April is the cruelest month, coaxing lilacs out of the dead ground. So, uh, I think April this year is, is cruel in other ways, in uh, many, many ways. The, uh, uh, the, the challenge of the illness and the loss of so many loved ones, uh, the decimation of, of uh, life and society, the economies, and so many uh, difficulties are 
uh, are cruel and challenging, but also that um, these festivals, these, these uh, recollections that we have with Easter, with Songkran, and with the, the, uh, the image of enlightenment, is reminding us that, that this kind of difficult, this kind of challenge is not the whole story, that there is a potential, uh, a, a, a dimension of our being which is not limited by that, which is not, say, confined or defined by those, uh, uh, those aspects of pain and difficulty and death. One particular um, reflection on this that came to mind also was uh, Ajahn Buddhadasa, one of the most um, uh, respected and famous uh, Buddhist teachers in uh, recent years in Thailand, who uh, passed away a number of years ago. But uh, he was very, uh, uh, say, eclectic in his uh, studies and in his teaching and was invited to give lectures at a Christian seminary and uh, wrote a very well-known book called uh, <coughs> Buddhism and Christianity. Uh, having been invited to give give talks and give instruction at a Christian seminary in Thailand and helped the, the Thai translation of the Bible uh, to be um, to be formed in a, a helpful way. He liked to talk about the symbol of the crucifix, uh, as uh, he said, is a very good spiritual symbol, because uh, it's uh, in, and he was using the, the the English language. He said because uh, in the crucifix you have the the word I crossed out. So he think this is a symbol of letting go of self. This is a, a, a way we have in, in, in Buddhist teaching of uh, the reflections on anatta, of uh, all dhammas are not self. He said this a symbol of the crucifix. Uh, is like the eye crossed out, so that the yeah, Buddhists can use this symbol as well. And again, I, uh, uh, I'm not trying to be uh, insulting or to fudge things together in, in too um, casual a way, but uh, I feel... Uh, that this way of looking at spiritual symbols, to uh, to contemplate them, to reflect upon them, and to consider how they can genuinely be used to free our own hearts and to be uh, bring benefit into our lives and the lives of others is something very very skillful. So that uh, uh, that uh, idea or that way of looking at the the crucifix as the eye crossed out that's a a way of uh, say conquering death in a very moment by moment uh, say, individual uh, say uh, approach or how we as uh, as individuals can look at how we die because it's not just when we talk about conquering death it can seem a bit dramatic or a bit remote and or something far away but uh, for for most of us ego death uh, is far more realistic and far more challenging or, or threatening than physical death and, you know, if we're not particularly ill or we're not close to the um, the caring for, for people in the illness or we haven't got the illness ourselves and uh, that the or, or others some other kind of life-threatening condition we, we might feel in an instinctual way that you know, my death is I'm going to die one day but, it, but it's, it's far off it's, it's distant it's remote but ego death that uh, feeling of being rejected uh, by the, the people that you love being unappreciated uh, doing something and then failing, um, uh, receiving the, the kind of signals of not being wanted, not being uh, uh, approved of, not being a, uh, uh, appreciated, uh, all of that, just even saying those words, you can feel a sort of, ooh, there's a tensing in the heart. So ego death is, uh, is something that all of us can, can uh, relate to, uh, that sense of trying to do something and getting it wrong, cooking a meal and it, going, it coming out really, tasting really awful or not being cooked properly or being burnt or, or um, people being uh, critical or disgusted by what you cooked or giving a Dhamma talk that half the people get up and walk out, <laughs> switch, off their, switch off their computers, say, oh, this isn't really worth listening to. It's much better last week uh, uh, as maybe you just uh, think you're doing. <laughs> so that, uh, that feeling of, uh, of, of ego death is very is very close to us. We 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 all know that, and that sense of being unloved, being rejected, being um, a, uh, a failure. There's something in the heart winces at that. And I often quote this study that was carried out many many years ago, when the uh, Harvard University Psychology Department did a survey of what people were afraid of, and the you know the top ten things included being physically attacked having uh, your house burgled, having members of your family killed, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the experience of war, your country being invaded. And so uh, 
The number two on the list of the top ten things to be afraid of was nuclear war and the destruction of life on Earth. But number one was fear of public speaking. That, that's really an amazing thing to me, that we're more afraid of dying on stage than we are of destruction of life on Earth. Uh, it, so, isn't that, um, isn't that an incredible thing, that uh, we are uh, more terrified of that kind of ego death than the, the destruction, even for uh, far more wise, widespread and, uh, and appalling destruction than is caused by this disease. Me dying on stage is, is far worse uh, on, on one level. So talking about the conquest of death, uh, it's learning to look at the way that the mind attaches uh, self-view, sees things in very personal terms. The I want, I should, I have to, this is mine, this belongs to me, you've got that, I want that. Uh, I, I used to have this, now I've, uh, and then I lost it. Uh, I, I want to get that in the future. Uh, all of that uh, self-centered thinking uh, is very ordinary, very com common for us. But uh, so much of the teachings point to the, the um, and the number of the, the questions that people have, have asked me to respond to today. Uh, uh, they revolve around that, that issue of how we create so much difficulty and division and, and distress within ourselves and, and in the world around us with self-centered thinking. And if we can change the view, change the, the habits of how our life is appreciated, how the world around us is appreciated, then we find that um, if we see things from a, a more nature-centered view or a dharma-centered view, as we would put it in, in a Buddhist language, then things come in, into balance. So life is a lot more workable and the, the heart is far more spacious. There's a, a feeling of unburdenedness. So when we talk about conquering death or freeing the heart from, from birth and death, can sound a bit melodramatic or a bit distant, something a bit grandiose, but uh, on a more personal level, a more tangible level, it's essentially learning how not to be selfish, learning how to uh, to live in a in a way to see things in a way that is not centered around I and me and mine, but rather centered around nature, around the way reality is. So I'll um, pick up some of these. Uh, questions that we have um, to, uh, today. So firstly, uh, how to deal with anger during the lockdown in a family getting on each other's nerves? <laughs> so, didn't we cover this last week? <laughs> but uh, I think this is a perennial issue and now we are April the 12th, so in this country the lockdown began March 24th, so this is about the third week of the lockdown. And it's also, again, it's a, a tragic situation because uh, already within this country, and I, I know in other places around the world, the instances of domestic violence and child abuse have been escalating, along with the great acts of kindness and self-sacrifice that have also been um, the, the negative side of people um, being uh, in this uh, this uh, ep uh, epidemic situation and people uh, being forced to be close to each other, it's resulting in a lot of you know, anger and tension and uh, unskillful um, uh, say impulses taking over and, and dominating the mind. So that uh, I feel that the um, this particular issue of dealing with anger and uh, it, it helps that if you have had a Buddhist practice or a meditation practice before the lockdown started. You know, it's rather like, uh, don't try and do your preparation for the exam once you're already in the exam hall. It's good to, to have done your your um, uh, your preparation, to have done your revision before you walk into the uh, exam hall. Um, but still, uh, even if uh, we are in the middle of the lockdown and being challenged, I feel that um, this... Uh, we, we can use the resources of the Buddha's teaching and, and the practice of meditation, uh, particularly to, uh, to see that emotions are not personal. So if we have a feeling of anger, the, the way the mind holds that, like you might think, I'm angry with you, yeah. and the, I'm angry with you uh, is a natural feeling. You know, you've done something that's annoying, I feel angry with you. So to work with that or to... to um, to deal with that impulse in a, or that emotion in a skillful way, then uh, we might um, 
have the idea, oh, anger's really bad, I shouldn't feel this way, and try to suppress it and just push it down. But uh, as with any other natural system, if you have pressure and you try to just uh, uh, block it off, then it can result in an even bigger explosion later on. So we're not trying to su suppress negative or destructive emotions or to follow them, but rather if we can see that this angry feeling this is part of the human landscape. That I have a body, I have a, ma I have a mind, therefore anger can be felt as part of the, the repertoire. We don't have to think of it as me and mine, even though we might, we feel it, and that anger and that, uh, is, uh, has arisen in the heart, and it's here. We might naturally say, I'm angry, but uh, we also don't have to relate to it in a personal way. We didn't invent anger, like nobody here was the inventor of anger or jealousy or, or, or desire. It existed in the world before you were born. Yeah, it's not something that you've, uh, you've created. So if we see that anger is a natural force, is a, a natural um, a, a mind state, uh, a, a product of our animal ancestry, uh, having a body, having a mind, uh, living in this human world, yeah, that, that feeling can arise. So then, uh, if we are able to, uh, first of all, not to take it personally, but to see, well, this is the feeling of anger, um, and it's arisen, but then also to see that we're not victims of our emotional states. We're not a victim of life. And uh, Ajahn Sumedho would very, very regularly point this kind of thing out. We're not a helpless victim. And this is one of the things the Buddha's teaching points to, and uh, our teachers remind us of over and over again, how we have a choice. Um, even though a feeling might be very strong, desire or fear or anger, that we do have a choice, that the mind that, uh, is able to decide to act on that or not. And if uh, we are seeing that anger is destructive and you're feeling a lot of that, living uh, more close than you'd like to with your beloved family members, <laughs> then to be able to know that, oh, this is the feeling, uh, and it, but it's up to, to this mind. There's a choice that can be made. Will this be followed or not? Is there something to pursue or not? If this is followed, what will happen? Uh, if it's not followed, what will happen? So even though it might be happening very quickly, we do have that, that capacity. And the more that we develop mindfulness, the more, the more that we train that quality of, of awareness, mindful attention to be brought to the flow of our, our days and our, what we see here, smell, taste, and touch, the more we'll be able to apply that as those feelings of anger or fear or desire or restlessness. Lots of people feel that they're, they're really you know, so frustrated being locked up in this idyllic spring weather is not helping in this respect. If it was all kind of cold and rainy and nasty outside, it would be a bit easier. But it's like paradise, at least here in the UK. Uh, the beautiful spring weather with the flowers blossoming, and the, the cherry trees covered in, uh, in their flowers. And, Bluebells and uh, the whole sort of spring uh, and glory uh, is, is all around us. So we can feel frustrated. But there, that choice is there. We can choose that there's that possibility without pushing it down, without suppressing that feeling, and without following it blindly. Just to say, well, here's the feeling of frustration. It's like this. Here's the feeling of anger. It's like this. Uh, and it can be known uh, as it arises, as it does its thing, as it does its thing, as it passes away. There's no claiming of it um, as a personal possession. It's not uh, mine. Uh, it doesn't have to be suppressed. Yes, it's unskillful, but it doesn't have to be followed. It, uh, it's, uh, it's up to us what we do with it. And so then the more that we see that we can allow those feelings to pass through without acting, acting on them, then having done that once or twice or three times, then we realize, oh, I can do this. This is possible. I'm not a victim. And so that uh, the, the direct seeing of how we are able to watch that, that the mind can, can observe, can know the, the flow of experience and not be a victim, not just pulled along by it, then that strengthens the, the faith that oh, we can do that in the future. That's how we can be. The second question, how to deal with anger towards all the fools, quote-unquote, spreading misinformation, anger, and fear on the news and in the social media? Same, same. <laughs> Whether it's just within the confines of your 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 apartment, your monastery, your uh, your home, or, or, or whether it's around in the world, I would say it's exactly the same principle. Uh, whether it's looking into a TV screen and going, oh, how could they do that? 
or whether it's the, the person on the other side of the living room, it, it works in a very, very similar way. Another thing I like to point out is that in Buddhist psychology, uh, you're not entirely sane until you're an arahant. The only arahants are sane. So everyone who is not an arahant, which I would probably uh, safely assume is most of the, the, the those gathered here and those watching this or listening to this around the world, uh, are not arahants. So effectively, this is the psychiatric ward. So these we are surrounded by our fellow patients uh, in the psychiatric ward. The people uh, on the TV or the people in the news feeds through the, your computer, they are psychiatric patients. They are not fully sane, assuming that all of the um, commentators and, and uh, people offering opinions and, and doing various things uh, to spread news or, or their brand of reality around, they are all uh, not sane. They, they are... Um, people who are, are crazy. Uh, we are, and so if we look at us, each other in, uh, in this way, if we look at, uh, at us, who we are, this group gathered as fellow patients in the psychiatric ward, then uh, we find ourselves becoming a lot more uh, compassionate and forgiving. We make space for each other. It's like, oh, yeah, Joe, he's a bit crazy. Yeah, he, he likes to stand in that corner and talk to the wall because that's Joe. He's like that. That's, that's how he is. And, and Sarah, you know, she, she likes to, to stand in the doorway. And uh, that's her favorite place. She likes to stand in the doorway and uh, and to talk to the uh, the architrave around the door, and that's that's her thing. So so be it. You know, so that uh, again, I'm not trying to make light of mental illness or, or, or just uh, belittle those difficulties. But but if we change our perception, because one of the reasons why we suffer so much about the uh, destructive behavior uh, of from politicians or news people or People are active you know, spreading their um, opinions of various different types around the world. How can they do that? That's ridiculous. That's awful. That's totally untrue. And in a way, we're judging them as if they were arahants. If this person was uh, was pure-hearted, honourable, and uh, guaranteed noble, unselfish, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, then how could they say that? How could they have that opinion? So then, if they were arahants, that would be a reasonable complaint. But if you change the perception, they say, well, this person's crazy. So, of course, they're going to say weird things or be deluded or have their, their perceptions heavily biased because of some preferred version of reality. So then uh, we find ourselves far more forgiving, far more able to make space for each other, which doesn't mean to say that we condone that kind of destructive uh, misinformation or uh, the harm that's being done. Certainly. We try to do things and work in ways that minimize the suffering of others. But I find if we, if we, if we stop judging each other um, as if we were all saints, if we, as if we were all arahants, then we find ourselves a lot less outraged by the poor behavior uh, of each other. It, it, and I, I talk about this a lot and have frequently brought this up over the years, when people feel unforgiving towards their parents, uh, how they badly what a bad job they did, how badly brought up they were because their parents were really cruel or selfish or incompetent. And uh, and so if we take a step back, and, and, and I found this for myself in my own family, when I, when I reached the kind of age that my, my parents were when uh, I was born, so they were in their, already in their 30s when they met, my parents. So when I got into my uh, mid to late 30s, and I could put myself in their shoes, I realized, well, you know, Dad was doing the best he could. Why, why should he have known what to do with a, these little children running around? It's like he, he was the youngest of five children, so he never had any younger siblings to, to deal with. And he was six years younger than his nearest sister. So uh, why should he know what to do with these little sprogs running around? He's got uh, no background in that. So, so oh, well, maybe he was just doing the best he could given the situation he was in. Oh. And so, uh, uh, just, just speaking from my own experience, that, that made a big change in the, the way that I related to, to my own dad. So I would encourage that. If you're sh also um, shouting at uh, um, machines, <laughs> at, at the, shouting at the screen and, and, and waving your fist, uh, you might realize that also could be classed as less than enlightened behavior. And, uh, expecting labor-saving devices or, or um, luminous rectangles to respond to you, unless you've got some kind of um, Skype call or, or FaceTime going on, 
you know, that's also kind of crazy behavior, you know, yelling at a machine, that the machine will not be able to respond to you. So, third one. Worry of loss uh, of job or income, or worry of getting sick, dying, or losing loved ones. Uh, again, I talked about um, this a little bit last week, I think. The um, this experience of, of anxiety, worry, and, and fear, and um, to be able to recognize and to reflect on the thinking mind. And to, uh, there's a couple of things with respect to this that are helpful. That uh, first of all, uh, taking the, the, the fundamental principle that just because you think it, it doesn't mean it's true. So um, that, uh, that thought of, uh, I can't go to work, my, my, work, uh, my, my work situation is completely ruined, uh, will I ever get another job? Will I, will I ever be able to work properly again? And that might feel like a completely reasonable question or a, a source of anxiety. And so that if you take a step back from that and say, well, here is a question. It begins, it ends. You don't have to buy into it. Um, uh, or that feeling of, I'm never going to be able to work properly again. I, I know it, I know it. That's a, a thought that's forming in the mind. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So that you're not denying that that thought has arisen, but you also don't have to call it true. You have to say this is a, an accurate representation of reality. It's just a thought passing through the mind. I'm never going to work again. I'm never going to work again. It's a, it's a thought form. It arises, it passes away. Who says it's true? Who says it's accurate? Who says it matches any kind of objective reality? That's what the mind adds to it. So that's part of it. So that if we can take that perspective that just because you think it, it doesn't mean it's true, that, again, makes the world a lot more spacious, a lot, a lot broader. Um, similarly, as I was saying about the emotion of anger, the, um, the sense of of not having to take things personally. Just because the thought has arisen within your mind doesn't mean to say that it's it's you or yours. And so these two principles with relationship to, to thinking, particularly worrying, that, uh, that the your thoughts are not necessarily true and they're not yours. They're, they are patterns of, uh, of experience, just like a, a wave of anger through the heart. We can relate that just to, as to the sounds, like it's springtime, so we hear a lot of birds, so the birds are... Uh, chirping and making their nests and, and uh, having a grand old time. So we can also relate to our, our thoughts just as the chattering of the birds. So uh, some advice I often give to in this respect is those of you who are familiar with uh, the uh, Peanuts cartoons, Charlie Brown and uh, the whole Peanuts gang, that uh, you might have noticed that adults don't really play much of a, of a role in the, in, in the Charlie Brown Peanuts world. And if adults do appear then all they ever say is gag, 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 gag. So no adult has anything meaningful to say in, the, in Charlie Brown's world. So in the same way, you can reframe the thinking mind as gag, 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 gag. You know, there it goes. It's just the, that, the, the thinking mind doing its, uh, doing its thing. That's all. We don't have to, to be burdened or stressed by that. Again, I don't want to sound too flippant or casual because our, uh, our thoughts can be extremely stressful and burdensome. But just taking those basic principles of, of, uh, of changing the view, changing the attitude towards thought. So, uh, just because we think it doesn't mean it's true, and to not see thoughts as who and what we are, but rather it's like the birds don't belong to me. I, I hear the sound of them, but it's just the sound of the birds. Or if you're hearing the, the people talking in the kitchen, or if you're, if you're in your homes hearing uh, the TV through the wall of the, of the next door neighbors. Uh, you didn't choose what the station that people are listening to. You, you're not part of the conversation that's going on in the next room. You can hear it. The, the content has its impact, but it's not personal. And in exactly the same way, we can relate to our, the, the thoughts going on in our mind. And most of them, it's just the reverberations of memory and imagination. And we don't have to give it too much reality. We don't have to reify it. So then the fourth one on this little first list, uh, someone mentioned praise and blame as well. For instance, how Americans blame the Chinese these days for the coronavirus and many, many other things. Uh, so the um, yeah, blaming, 
uh, creating uh, you know, that which is the source of my problems out there is an ancient um, custom, <laughs> ancient tradition, and uh, right back to our beginnings as a as a human family, in, uh, one or two hundred thousand years ago, three hundred thousand years ago, as uh, as the human family began, then uh, one of the things that brings us together and makes us feel solid as a group is is our opposition to that lot, the uh, the tribe across the other side of the river, you know that lot. Uh, who live live up the mountain? They're not like us down here in the valley, or the the people in the next valley over. I don't even want to talk about them. So we we create the other, and it helps create a, a stronger bond between those in, in our group. And so this is, uh, I would I wouldn't focus on the Americans and the Chinese in this respect, but rather to see how often in the human world we create a, a sense of identity, we strengthen our identity by having an enemy, by having a, an other, by having a a thing to complain about, and um, so that that um, uh, that way of blaming others or, or making something into a, an enemy or, or, a, or a problem that lot over there, then uh, I feel it's something to to have a compassionate attitude towards. Like, yeah, that's what we do as human beings. We we identify with a team, to, uh, with our group. You know, we're blue team. We're the red team. Yeah, really. We're the Theravada team, we're the Mayan team, we're the Buddhists, we're the Christians, we're the, we're the Hindus, we're the Muslims. You know, we, uh, and even though um, the content of those different affiliations, whether it's a football team or a religion or a nationality or gender or whatever it might be, a lot of, what, of the driving force of that, uh, of that process and that sense of, yeah, this is what I am, it's to have that feeling of I am. It's a, a, a hunkara, a, I amness. Mamankara, this is mine. That's a, a very powerful instinctual uh, force within our lives as human beings. And uh, the more we can understand that, and we can see, oh, I'm, uh, I'm getting focused on the problem with that lot and blaming them. And really, the, the issue most of the time, uh, I would say, or a lot of the time, it's not really to do with the, what the other is or what they're doing or what they are espousing or, or, or embodying, but rather a lot of the driving force is this, the, the, the urge, the hunger for identity uh, within us. And that, uh, speaking of ego death, as I was at the beginning of this, undefined being, not being anything, is, is, is terrifying. And we want to be something. And so uh, I've found this in my, um, my own practice, watching my, my mind many times over. Um, that uh, an, an example I give, an everyday example that I give to, uh, to illustrate this that most people are familiar with is um, you, know, you carry out some kind of task. You're, you're cleaning out the stores or you're, you're tidying up your home or you're doing the washing up and uh, some kind of ordinary everyday task and you're, you're busy with it, you're engaged in it and finally after a long time you come to the end of it and you, you plunk yourself down and you go, ah! And there's a relief that that particular task is finished, and then there can, and then there can be this this sort of strange hollow feeling of oh oh what what what, what else is there or, or what's what's next or, or what do I do now? And then we remember the the list of things we have to do. Oh oh, there's 45 emails to reply to. Or, oh my goodness, there's I was um, I got all the all the rubbish to take out. And then ha, ah, you feel relieved because you've got more to do. Is that familiar? That you're glad that you have got something that you are supposed to be doing. You're, something in you is glad to have those 45 emails that need replying to, or is glad to have more cleaning to do, or more, or another building to clear out. Because that in that moment, that sense of, oh, what am I? If I'm not the, the washer upper, if I'm not the, 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 the store cleaner, if I'm not the uh, 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 Identified with this particular activity, what am I? Uh, and many, many years ago, when I was a, a student in in London, I had a kind of mild psychotic episode, and uh, I was looking in a mirror, and I wasn't hallucinating, but I couldn't get any meanness into the face that I was seeing in the mirror, and it was extremely distressing. It's like, well, if I'm not that, what am I? And for several weeks, there was this this kind of terror. Uh, this insecurity. Well, um, what what is that? 
face, that, that, that human thing, got to do with this experience of, of being or knowing. And it seemed that the, the, the gulf between mind and its formless qualities and this sort of human characteristics of a, 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 a face with a, you know, a nose and eyes and a beard, and whatever, was just there was no connection at that time. Fortunately, after a month or six weeks, it, it uh, passed on. But it was, uh, I think, something that is a driving force in many of our lives. We, we love I, uh, the feeling of, of identified being. And when that uh, identity falls away, mm -hmm. and so that when we remember something that we're responsible for, even something that we're guilty of, or something that we have some unrequited love, oh yeah, there's that thing that can never be fixed, that can never be repaired. <sighs> it's kind of weird. You know, that we, we, are, we feel relieved to have that thing that unavoidably defines me. That, that, oh, that's, that was broken and it was my fault and it can never be repaired. That was a bad thing that I did. <sighs> and, and again, I'm not trying to make light of this entirely, <laughs> but it, it's a weird thing that we, we, we prefer even a painful identity to, uh, to having... Uh, uh, that's an unformed sense of uh, being, a formless being. Better to be a brilliant wounded fragment than to have no formed meanness. So uh, the Buddha's teaching on anatta and this sort of deleting the eye is challenging because it's actually walking straight into that realization uh, in a deliberate and conscious way to, to steer the mind towards letting go of of that, because the Buddha realized, yeah, we, we get a lot of comfort. We have a, a very strong impulse to identify with things and to be things, but that's not what we are. So, be dhamma anatta. All uh, all things are not self. And so that uh, the Buddha's teaching encourages us to actually make the turn towards that, that undefined being, and to say yes, rather than no. no. And just to, to complete that story about myself as a, when I was a hairy student looking in the mirror, trying to get me or the sense of I into that sort of strange you know, monkey looking out of the, of the mirror at me. Um, when I, I, I'd already entered the Sangha, I'd been a monk for a, a year or two, and I had a, a kind of a, a revisiting of that experience. I had a similar event come back. But rather than it being terrifying, um, that sense of, of identity fell away. It was when I was uh, spending the rains retreat down by myself, myself and one other Anagarika in a small um, temporary vihara in the west of England. And everybody had gone away for the day. The Anagarika had gone out for a, a day-long walk and I was just by myself in the, in the, in the caravan, in the vihara. And it's, oh, who am I? What am I if I haven't got the lay people here or the Anagarika? And that sense of identity, identity fell away rather than me terrifying and say, oh great, this is, this is what uh, these Anatta teachings are talking about. Oh great, this is, <laughs> this is just what I've been looking for. And so that the, the, the emotional tone of it was the polar opposite of when I was a, a hairy student, I was a hairless monk, uh, then it was, and it had a context of, the, of the, the, the Dhamma teachings to say, yeah, because that, that body, that face, that personality, that was never who and what, what you are. That was... It was an assumption that that's what you thought you were. That was never the, the true reality of it. So nothing has been lost, uh, but rather the mind is waking up to that formless uh, dimension uh, of the Dhamma itself. So a few more questions. I'm not doing very well with the timekeeping. It's nearly the 45 minutes already, but never mind. <laughs> okay. From a Buddhist perspective, how could a better new world look? Because obviously, it's not going to be the same after the COVID-19 leaves us. Um, well, it's, uh, I could talk for a long time on this. <laughs> the, uh, it's interesting that in the Buddha's teaching, it's one of those religious forms that doesn't talk about a golden age. It doesn't talk about, at least the southern Buddhist world, in the Pali scriptures. You never have uh, the Buddha saying, and if, if uh, everybody follows my teaching, then uh, there will be this um, all beings will enter the, um, will, will go to paradise and be there forever, or that there will, humanity will enter a golden age and things will be glorious and beautiful and peaceful forever. There's not a hint of that. There's, that just does not appear in the mythology of the Pali Canon. 
So it's not a golden age, quote unquote, philosophy. But rather what you have is that there are islands of opportunity. So at certain times and certain places, things come together in such a way so that, say, when the, the Buddha was born, that there's a certain amount of coherence in society, there's uh, enough free time, there's enough resources where people have got the time to meditate, people are not just fighting with each other over, uh, uh, over land, over food, uh, over territory and dominance. There is enough stability, enough abundance, uh, and also enough uh, of uh, moral responsibility within society that then people can uh, use their time, their energy, their efforts to uh, really respect and love the good and to train the mind to awaken to the fundamental reality of things. And those islands of opportunity, they only, they're only islands for a little while and then whew, things get swept away. The wars come or there's a famine or there's difficulties, uh, conflicts, uh, and so then those islands um, uh, sink down below the, the ocean, as it were. So that rather than a messianic age of when everything will be, um, uh, you know, great God will come from the sky, take away everything, and everybody uh, will be fine. Uh, it's a... Um, uh, it's talking about making use of those uh, those islands of opportunity, those times of of integration where we have things come together in a good way. Um, make hay while the sun shines, as as it says. You know, that use the opportunities uh, as they as they come, because it, 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 there's no guarantee it'll be um, coming back again. So that's again, it's maybe not a very hopeful religious idea, but I feel it's also very Realistic, and that uh, uh, the um, the encouragement again, as in so many ways with the, with Buddha Dhamma, it's putting it back onto you. It's not sort of saying oh, with a, uh, promising something wonderful for the future, but turning it back to us as individuals. It's, it's more about what you do now and taking uh, taking full use, uh, taking full advantage of the possibilities that you have now, and doing what good you can now. Um, also, speaking of a, of a sort of golden age or a mess messianic age, one thing that comes to mind in that respect that, that Lumpur Sumedho would often say is, uh, he said, and we're talking about the precepts and moral, and moral responsibility. He said, um, if everybody in the human family, if everybody in the world only kept the first precept, that if, if there was, not that everyone would live by the five precepts, uh, yeah, worldwide, but even just the first precept, uh, and not just the, you know, uh, the, the first precept with a relationship to animals, but if, if it, around the world everyone agreed to just to stop killing other human beings, the world would be so radically changed it would be uh, you know, unrecognizable. And so I think yeah, in terms of a, of a messianic age, that's a, an interesting and you know, helpful concept. Uh, and and Lumpur Sumedha would say that quite often, that if, if we just stopped killing other, other people, the world would be so radically transformed it would be unrecognizable from the world we know today. I don't think it will ever happen. <laughs> uh, it's the kind of thing that people say, well, what if everybody became a Buddhist, uh, Buddhist monk or a Buddhist nun? And uh, you know, what would happen? Who would, who would feed you then? You know, who, who would drive the buses? Who would, you know, who would run the hospitals? Yeah. And uh, Ajahn Chah, when he was asked this kind of question, he's saying that's like, uh, an earthworm worrying that it's going to run out of earth. You know, it's, it's never going to happen. And somebody once asked Ajahn Viridamo that question, and I think it's an, it's an, uh, an old Latvian saying, he's from Latvia, a Latvian family. He's, someone said, to, if everyone became a Buddhist monk, what would, what would happen to the world? And, uh, you know, and he said, yes, it's possible, but also uh, what would happen if my grandmother had wheels and, and then she'd be a bus? <laughs> but no, the question was, you know, what would happen you know, if, if everybody became a Buddhist nun or a Buddhist monk, then you know, uh, what would happen to the world? He said, yes, if my grandmother had wheels, she would be a bus. <laughs> and so that uh, the person then realized, hmm, I don't think he's taking me fully seriously. <laughs> But like Ajahn Chah is saying about the earthworm, it's just not going to happen. When the most coarse, violent, crazy, selfish person wants to uh, shave their head, wear robes, and live a celibate lifestyle and have no possessions, 
humanity will be radically transformed. If that's the most kind of violent, selfish person on the planet, still wants to be a Buddhist nun or a Buddhist monk, then uh, what the uh, people at the other end of the spectrum will be like is, is kind of indescribable. Okay. Ajahn, is it true that sharing one's merit can only be done for hungry ghosts? How does all this work, please? Uh, I say, no, I don't know where that, um, that uh, picture came from, but um, no, just in the chanting that we do um, for the sharing of blessings, we recite the words, may all beings receive the blessings of my life, may they soon attain the threefold bliss and realize the deathless, so that the sharing of blessings is, as a practice, is, is not... Uh, uh, and say confined just to one class of beings like the hungry ghosts, but rather it's for uh, all beings. And it's rather like the, the practice of uh, loving kindness. You know, if you are um, bringing a being to mind and, and consciously dedicating the whatever uh, goodness of your life, there's a, a, um, uh, a power, there's a strength in that, in that thought, just as if somebody sends you a card or during this, this uh, epidemic, I'm getting all kinds of, of people just randomly I think there's a lot of boredom going on. So, oh, how's your number? I'll write to him. I haven't been in touch with him for a long time. So, getting a few random contacts from people on my contact list. They'll say, hi, how are you? What's, what's, how's things going at the monastery? Are you all right? Are you getting any food? Uh, so it's very touching that people are, are, are in touch, but I think it's also because people have time on their hands. But just as if you reach out and then you, you receive these messages from people and they say, oh my goodness, uh, Stephen's thinking of me, or oh, uh, Sati Sati is thinking of, uh, of us all here at Amravati. There's a warm feeling in your heart to know that someone has, has thought of you, that they're, they're, they want to help you, they want to, to offer what support they can. So there's a, a feeling of encouragement, a brightness in, in the heart. So just as if you receive a card or an email or a phone call from, from someone and it's a they're expressing a gesture of caring and generosity and kindness. There's a warmth in your heart. So that that sharing of blessings, I would say it works in exactly the same fashion without using the electronic media or the postal service. But just in terms of mind, if you bring someone to mind um, and uh, you think of them, you think of their name, you bring them to mind and you send forth those, those feelings of caring, then there is a, a way that that touches the lives of those other beings. Uh, I can't pretend to say I have psychic powers or the ability to see exactly how that works. But one thing you can reflect on in, in this respect is that the body occupies three-dimensional space. But space, three-dimensional space, doesn't apply to the mind. There isn't a place where my mind stops and yours begins. You know, place and mind don't, uh, don't, um, don't fit together. Place and location only has relevance in terms of material form. In terms of mind, the Namakandas, place, location, doesn't have any, any meaning or relevance. So uh, my mind and your mind, to, to use those kind of terms, they, they have to overlap because where uh, geography doesn't really have any, uh, any impact. Three-dimensional space, I would suggest, doesn't have any relationship to mind. So if someone's living in Australia or, or in America or in, in Thailand or China, that um, the, the, the fact of geographical difference doesn't have to have any impact. I'm, I personally, I don't feel that it, it does. So that bringing someone to mind, the geography of where they happen to be located on the planet or whatever realm they might be in, um, then uh, to me that's a, that's a incidental. Okay, moving on. Ajahn, thanks for your Dhamma Dana today. Uh, I was wondering if in Buddhism they have something akin to the Hindu concept of Sat Chit Ananda, being consciousness bliss. Um, well, the way that the Buddha, I, again, I think I was talking about this a week or two ago, the way that the Buddha approached it, rather than taking positive concepts like being consciousness bliss and sort of saying yeah, that that's what we really are, because those are, as I understand it within the Vedic philosophy, that's the, the nature of the Atman, of the, the, the sort of self, or the, the Atta, was um, Sat Chit Ananda, being consciousness and bliss. The Buddha approached it from a completely different angle. Rather than having an idea of a self, that its true nature is sat chit ananda, uh, he, start, he instead uh, uh, approached the whole issue from the uh, position of not-self, anatta, and saying that anything that you think, anything that you think that you are is not what you are. So 
the um, uh, the reflections on anicca dukkha anatta uh, are a way of entering into this whole question and to to see how the mind identifies with the body, the personality, our name, our age, our social affiliations. I'm a Theravadan, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a woman, I'm a man, I'm old, I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm sick. And uh, so that the teaching on anatta, the anatta lakana sutta, is a way of, of, of analyzing uh, that, uh, that set of habits of identification and, and unpicking it using a way of anal analysis, what's called vibhajavada, there, analyzing what we habitually think that we are and saying not that, not that, not that, not that, not that. And then rather than saying at the end of it, and the true atta is, the Buddha never does that. Uh, instead, uh, he's, he, he approaches it by, uh, 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 say, encouraging that recognition of, by letting go of, uh, of what we are not, what the reality is, uh, is revealed, uh, uh, that, the, that is realized. You don't have to have an idea, oh, the real self is, uh, is the Dhamma, I am the Dhamma, or the, the real me is this pure awareness, because that uh, set of words, the real me is the Dhamma, or uh, I am the Dhamma, or the, the real me is pure awareness, those are just words, they're just concepts. And the whole approach of the Buddha was, rather than giving a, a set of concepts to hang on to and to, to believe in and to to sort of say this is what I uh, this is what I, I believe and this is what I am as a, a set of ideas his his approach was to help bring about the transformation of attitude within the heart to change the view of uh, uh, of the the mind to, to enable the mind to see things in a different way so that rather than creating a different idea about what we are is he was training uh, uh, people, training uh, beings to let go of those, of those habits of what we think we are and then letting the, the reality of what is uh, be what uh, remains, that, that be, be, say, freed from the, the occlusions, the, the, the screening produced by the mind's attachments to different ideas and identities. So that um, when the, uh, and as the Buddha said, when the heart is free of the conceit I am, that is Nibbana here and now. Uh, that uh, when that I am feeling is completely let go of, when it's seen as transparent and empty, then what remains is Nibbana. They say, oh, I am Nibbana. Say, no, no, no. <laughs> if it's got I am in it, wrong. Bing. That's the clue. Uh, and uh, there's another one particular teaching where um, the Buddha says, it's called the Panchataya Sutta in the uh, Middle Length Discourses, where the Buddha said, it might be that this meditator, there's someone sitting there meditating, and their heart is very pure, they are, they are peaceful and calm, and that the thought arises in their mind, I am at peace, I am without clinging, I have realized Nibbana. And they said, the very way the mind phrases it demonstrates the clinging that is still there. I am at peace, I am without clinging, I have realized Nibbana. So, ding! <laughs> So any I amming uh, is uh, a signal that, that there's still clinging going on. So, uh, number eight. When considering bigger lifestyle or job changes, what are the criteria by which one decides to, to take a move? And then the second paragraph said, pure being just knows, it has no agenda. That's not really a Buddhist philosophy, but... Um, how to be sure my decision came from that place of pure beingness? Well, um, you can't be sure. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, say in terms of decision making, the, the best thing to do is to empty the heart as fully and as completely as possible and to, um, uh, to let the mind be as focused, be as free of biases as possible, and to then bring up the question, what will be of the greatest benefit in this situation? And to listen, to attend, see what, what arises, if anything. And then rather than, if a thought might think, oh yes, I should go left or go right. Ah, oh, that's it, that's the right thing. To, instead of grasping that, and say, that's the right thing for me, say, okay, well, that, uh, that has arisen, uh, the thought go left, so... Um, uh, what will be the result of that, as far as I can tell? Kind of contemplating, reflecting, well, it looks, looks like a good way forward. And then to take the, uh, the attitude of, well, that looks like a good way forward, 
let's uh, head in that direction and see what happens. So that you're not saying, this is the right thing, and grasping it uh, as if there was a right thing, but rather taking a direction and seeing how things unfold. And, and if you read the Buddha's teachings and uh, look at the life of the Buddha, that's often how he operated, how he established the Vinaya discipline. He didn't just lay out all of the rules from scratch, but he waited until things happened and then he set down a, a provision and then people misunderstood it or took it too far or took it the wrong way and so, okay, well in this case, do this. Or, no, 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 that wasn't what I meant. Do this, do this. So it's a, a, there's an organic process of, of investigation, seeing how things unfold. So some of the Vinaya rules, there was about six or seven different uh, adjustments that the Buddha made along the way. He had to, uh, to, um, to do some tweaking because of the way that people had, had held it. So it, uh, I feel running our own life in the same way. Just take a step, see what happens. Where, where is it going? Does this look like a good way forward? Okay, keep going this way. And to not be, uh, to not be feeling like uh, you've you know, you've taken that decision, and I, I, I told myself it was. The, I know it was the right thing. Therefore, I've got to stick with it. And to, to borrow a, an ancient um, Native American uh, uh, expression, no matter how far you've gone down the wrong path, when you discover that uh, it was the wrong path, turn back. So, <laughs> don't feel that it's a matter of pride. No, I'm, I've taken this path. This is definitely the right way because this is what I've chosen. It's like, keep going. It's like. You know, if you if you were trying to get to Brighton, well, it's a bit different in the lockdown. <laughs> if you were trying to go to Brighton, and you see the signs saying Manchester, and then Edinburgh, like, no, no, keep going, keep going. It's like, um, well, unless there's an Edinburgh close to the south coast, I think, uh, I think we took a wrong turn here. So when you find that you've taken the wrong turn, don't, don't be embarrassed, don't, don't be proud, turn back. Dear Ajahn, I've heard it said that one who has realized the fruit of stream entry no longer doubts about, quote, what is and what is not the path of practice. What kind of doubts might arise in the mind of a stream enterer? What day is it today? <laughs> uh, apple or an orange? Yeah, so ordinary, everyday, practical things, I think that, that a stream enterer is not um, to be guaranteed to, to know which is the road to, Man which is the road to Manchester. I'm trying to get to Brighton, which is, you know, a stream enter would still need to look at the map and, or look at the GPS. Okay. Is it possible, even when somebody has reached stream entry um, uh, yet, to, uh, to get seriously mentally ill, like becoming very depressive or schizophrenic? Um, well, uh, according to the um, the, the, the teachings and also just uh, experience of, of how things are in this lifetime, you know, people can still get illnesses or people can be brain damaged. So just like for Ajahn Chah, you know, he was known to be an Arahant, but his, his, uh, he had brain damage from his uh, stroke so that uh, his thinking processes were quite scrambled. And so, but he could, he could be aware of that and he would make comments on that. And uh, in, in uh, the bi biography of Ajahn Chah that we were reading uh, earlier this year, Ajahn Jayasaro quoted the, you know, a particular time when Ajahn Shah said, oh, uh, I meant to say, come here, Sumedho, and I said, come here, Ananda. You know, that's interesting. So he could hear that, that he'd made a mistake. He meant to say one thing and something else came out of his mouth. And as his illness progressed, it, you know, things that were more and more kind of strange and, and unstructured you know, came out of his mouth. But the, um, the mind that is aware of that is not... Uh, is not deluded by that, it's not, it's not identified with it. So that with respect to, um, to depression or, or schizophrenia, then the, the mind can have ha hallucinations or can have strong emotions, can have feelings of, uh, of grief and such like. But the, the, uh, the degree to which that quality of knowing is brought to bear on it, oh, this is a very sad feeling, or this is, this is, this is a hallucination. Uh, and again, speaking of my, my own experience, um, I remember some years ago I was being treated for melanoma. I had uh, both the uh, Western doctors and you know, a surgeon who did the surgery on me, and then a Tibetan doctor. And this Tibetan doctor gave me various different medicines. And I was being treated for a couple of years by her. And, uh, and so one particular kind of medicine that she gave me was had some very, very intense effects. And I, and I, was, I had auditory hallucinations. 
And it was the winter time, and I was living in this little kuti in the forest of Apayagiri in California. And in the winter there, it's a time of rainstorms. And so this stream formed outside my kuti, and, and, and it turned into music. And so uh, it was very interesting because I was sitting in my kuti, and I could hear like a sort of a 70-piece orchestra, 90-piece orchestra playing Beethoven, you know, a Beethoven symphony that Beethoven hadn't written. It's just like a full orchestra doing a Beethoven type performance in the forest in California. It's like, I'm hearing this, and, uh, and it's not like being in a dream. You know, it's consistent. It's going on and on and on and on. I'm sitting there listening. Well, if I could write down music, I could, you know, be a, I could write my own symphony here. And then the next day, it was Led Zeppelin. <laughs> you know, same stream, same ears, roughly. Um, but the, the mind was making it, and again, very distinct. It's like a whole new Led Zeppelin extended piece. This is like dazed and confused, plus, plus, plus. Oh, this is interesting. And with you know, electric guitars, drums, the whole thing. You know, the next day is Wagner. Da, 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 da. The, the kind of Ride of the Valkyries. Again, a sort of Wagner type orchestral piece, but nothing that Wagner ever wrote. Wow. Um, so I knew it was a hallucination. And th there was not an orchestra outside my kuti. I wasn't in a deluded state, but there was certainly what you could call schizophrenic or, or uh, hallucinatory experiences. So the fact that I, I knew I'd taken this this medicine uh, was uh, was uh, a clear, you know, and that was an effect of the medicine on, on my mind was was very very helpful. But I feel if there's a degree of insight and clarity, then straight states of emotion or hallucinations or you know physical experiences they can be known with with great um coolness and clarity uh, speaking of Ajahn buddha dasa he was famous when he had gallstones he um he had the operation without an anesthetic because quote unquote he wanted to know what it felt like so the doctor the surgeon was 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 very freaked out and i think uh, it took a while to persuade the surgeon to actually go ahead and, and do this. Uh, this is the, the anecdote as I've, as I've heard it. So I presume it's true, but uh, eventually Ajahn Buddha Dasa managed to persuade at least a surgeon to do the surgery with no anesthetic, you know, cutting him open, taking the, the, um, the gallstones out, because he wanted to investigate the feeling, quote unquote. So that uh, and someone like Ajahn Buddha Dasa, having that degree of, of clarity, of, of insight, stability, of attention, could could lie there and have himself, his body opened up and have his gallstones taken out and be looking at the feeling. Most of I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but he, uh, it was quite, de quite deliberate so that uh, the mind, he wanted to, to, to test it and to see what it was like and to, to explore that sense of can the mind be clear and open and know that fe even that degree of, of uncomfortable feeling without being confused, without being taken up. So just a couple more. Dear Ajahn, grateful for the inspiring and helpful teachings. Uh, could you talk about letting go in our everyday life? Um, yes. <laughs> so as in many of these, um, uh, uh, these teachings, uh, 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 the essential thing is clean. The, the, this is the real troublemaker in our lives, the, the mind's ability to attach. And not to get too technical, but there's, in the teachings, uh, the, the Buddha talks about four different kinds of upadana. So there's kam upadana, which is um, a clinging to sense pleasure. So kam upadana, K-A-M-A, uh, K karma. So sense pleasure, clinging to sense pleasure. Dit upadana, clinging to views and opinions. Um, Silapak upadana, so clinging to conventions and rituals and uh, and um, customs, and attavad upadana, so clinging to the feeling of, of I and me and mine. So these are the areas of, of of clinging. But essentially, it all boils down to if there's clinging going on, let go. <laughs> so uh, and the signal for that is suffering. So if there is dukkha going on and that feeling of it shouldn't be this way or When's this going to be over? Or I've really got to keep this. I don't want to lose this. Then that there's dukkha there. So essentially, to 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 train the heart in the best way, and this is the the kind of core of the four noble truths is get to know dukkha. 
get to know that feeling of, of tensing in the heart, that, um, that stressing of the heart, that's the signal that uh, there is clinging going on. Then when there's a recognition of this is dukkha, there's dukkha going on, then to scan your universe, whether it's physical or mental or emotional or in the conceptual world, where is the attachment going on? Is it to sense pleasure? Is it to pain uh, or painful sense, or, uh, sense experiences? Is it to an opinion? Is it to do with a custom? Is it to do with feelings of I and me and mine? Where is it? Where is the attachment going on? And as uh, Lumpur Man said, it, uh, you, you scratch where it itches. If you have an itch in your leg, you don't scratch your head. So wherever the clinging is going on, that's where you let go. So first of all, that mindfulness of dukkha, the recognition of there's some clinging, scanning your experiential field to see where the clinging is going on. Wherever the clinging is going on, that's where you let go. And the last one. Dear Ajahn, how can we switch from seeing self of you to letting it go? And who sees and who lets go? Well, uh, the last question I would say, that's a wrong question. <laughs> that's a, uh, uh, and that's uh, a presumption that part of the, what's clinging is the sense that there's a me who's doing the clinging, and an I who is the clinger, uh, the, the Klingon, <laughs> as they quote the Star Trek, the, the one who's clinging on. And to say, well, no, it's not a person. There's a habit of clinging, and we call it a person. So I see or I let go. But that's also atavadu padana, so clinging to the feeling of self. Um, and from seeing self you to letting it go, essentially the, the, um, uh, the thing to do is to develop that consciousness of, of dukkha, that to, uh, to feel the tension, to feel the stressing in the heart, to... to Idang Dukang, this is Dukkha. And so in the Buddha's uh, instructions with the, with the Four Noble Truths, the, each of the four, four truths, the four principles, has a way of working with them. And for, for Dukkha, it's Parinyayanti. It, dukkha should be apprehended, it should be understood, it should be, should be uh, uh, received. Or like Gumpo Samedo would say, you have to understand it, you have to stand under it. Like, here is Dukkha. This is the experience of Dukkha. So, to go from from uh, really um, uh, just having it as a as a as kind of a, an object as or and seeing it in a conceptual way to feel that that dukkha and to rec and then that leads into the the, the realization of, of all of the four truths and to leading to dukkha niroda the cessation of dukkha so that it's not that person who's annoying. It's not that, that delicious taste I want to hang on to. It's not that sweet memory or it's not that warm feeling of someone's thought of me. Uh, it's dukkha. <laughs> yeah. So that it's that taking, uh, so going back to the very first question about ang being angry with your family members or your, your fellow monastics, it's, it's not her, it's not him, it's dukkha. So it's taking the attention off that thing which is the source of your annoyance or that that delightful, beautiful thing that you want to hang on to and you're afraid of losing, then it's, okay, oh no, this is dukkha, this is the, I don't want to lose this beautiful thing that I've got. Uh, I don't want to be uh, stuck with this painful thing that's, that's here. It's, <clears throat> this is association with the disliked, dukkha. Separation from the liked, dukkha. Not getting what you want, dukkha. So it's that turning around, changing the, the focus of attention, and then everything flows from there. So I will uh, finish for this week, and uh, thank you for your many good questions and your good attention, both for those here at Amravati and uh, around the world, uh, whoever might be listening and watching. And um, please do uh, consciously share the blessings of your life with all of those who are particularly doing everything they can to help stem the tide of this illness, and uh, those who have passed on and those who have uh, uh, losing loved ones or have lost loved ones and also the, those in the position of leadership uh, around the world so please uh, we share the blessings of our life please do the best you can and uh, have a good week <laughs>